Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are doing Introduction to Chinese Studies. Today is the 15th lecture, India-China Relations, Conflict and Peace. So far we have uh, seen in, in India-China Relations, Geopolitics and the Boundary Dispute and then uh, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai and 1962 war. So let me briefly uh, summarize what we have done so far and then we will continue our discussion. So India China relations began on a promising note. So India became independent on the 15th of August 1947 and China uh, was uh, taken over by the Communist Party on uh, 1st of October 1949. And India became the first non-communist country to recognize People's Republic of China. So People's Republic of China is the China ruled by the Communist Party. The other China ruled by the Kuomintang or, or the nationalist government, they shifted to uh, Taiwan, the island of Taiwan and it is, it is still called the Republic of China. So there are two Chinas in that sense, the People's Republic of China and the uh, Republic of China. And India recognizes the People's Republic of China and this was done in 1950. But then uh, the army of the Communist Party, People's Liberation Army invaded Tibet. Now Tibet was a kind of a buffer area between British India and the, uh, and the Chinese Empire and later Republic of China. There was a Shimla Convention of 1914 that ensured that outer Tibet, that is uh, today's Tibet autonomous re region, would uh, be free from interference of both the British as well as the Chinese. And uh, it, although China would be the suzerain power over it, it won't intervene in the day-to-day -day administration or the internal administration of outer Tibet. But uh, when the PLA invaded uh, Tibet, they were uh, the Tibetan government was forced to sign the 17 point agreement which ensured that the Chinese military had control over Tibet. Although uh, the, the Chinese government recognized the sanctity of the Dalai Lama and the Tibetan government as far as the internal administration is concerned, but uh, Tibet came direct under the control of the People's Liberation Army. Now, uh, in the last lecture, I had mentioned that Sardar Vallabhai Patel had, uh, had warned Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru that uh, uh, this is a dangerous situation and, and India needs to take certain actions in order to protect itself against uh, Chinese aggression. But uh, Pandit Nehru took the path of diplomacy and uh, signed the Panchil Agreement with China in 1954 in which uh, China recognized the trading rights of uh, Indians in Tibet, which was uh, initially guaranteed by the Young Husband Expedition of uh, 1904. But India withdrew its military and political assets and intelligence assets from Tibet as a kind of a confidence building measure so that the Chinese don't become suspicious of India. So India failed to support the Tibetan government uh, in the face of Chinese aggression and in return it, it retained certain trading rights, pilgrimage rights like in the Kailash Mansar over. Okay, so, so the Panchashil agreement basically undid the achievements of the British in, in, in Tibet. So the geostrategic uh, foothold that the British had gained in Tibet was given up by Pandit Nehru and that eventually uh, led to the 1962 war. So the Tibetans were not happy, they were under pressure and therefore they 
signed the 17 point uh, Dalai Lama visited Beijing and uh, for a time it seemed that the uh, issues had settled and China said that China does not have any boundary dispute with India and it does not have any claims over Indian territory. Uh, but uh, but uh, Chinese government was interfering in Tibet because Mao Zedong wanted land reforms and collectivization and uh, Tibet could not remain isolated from these developments and gradually land reforms were introduced in Tibet also in the mid 1950s and that led to uh, revolt by the Tibetans for example the Kampa uh, revolt. And the Dalai Lama, when he visited India, he proposed to Pandit Nehru that he wanted uh, to take asylum in India. And uh, Nehru, because he had very good relations with China at that time, refused. He said that Dalai Lama should cooperate with the Chinese government. Internally, also, there was a lot of disturbance within China. Uh, uh, Mao Zedong was uh, contending with his rivals within the Communist Party. Uh, especially after the Great Leap Forward, which was a big failure. It led to the death of millions of Chinese, uh, between 30 to 45 million Chinese died in this uh, uh, movement started by Mao. And as a result, Mao lost his popularity within the party and he was sidelined from the government. He resigned his uh, position as the chairman of the People's Republic of China, although he retained his control over the party as well as the a people's Liberation Army. So this kind of struggle was going on. Another important development was the Sino-Soviet split. So the uh, Chinese followed in the initial years of his founding the uh, leaning on one side policy. Basically in the Cold War between the Soviet Union and United States, China leaned on the side of Soviet Union and Soviet Union provided help to the Chinese. But gradually there uh, developed differences between the two. The Soviet Union wanted Mao to follow the Soviet line, while Mao wanted to follow an independent uh, policy. Now let us uh, see some of the developments towards the end of 1950s. So uh, the, uh, the situation became worse when uh, finally in, in 1959, the Dalai Lama decided to take asylum in India. By that time, uh, Pandit Nehru had realized that the Chinese were not being truthful with him. Uh, behind his back, they were criticizing Nehru as being uh, 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 siding with the West. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, Dalai Lama eventually came to India in 1959, when there was an uprising. And that uprising was then suppressed by the Chinese military. But the Dalai Lama received political asylum in India and he formed a government in exile. As a result, the relation between China and India worsened and Chinese be started to become mo even more aggressive and they started asserting their claims over Indian territory. Zhou Enlai, the Chinese premier, offered a uh, swap of territory. So, there are basically three sectors in the uh, Sino-Indian uh, boundary dispute. There is the eastern sector, which basically is the McMahon line and uh, Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh is it's south of the McMahon line. So that is the India-China boundary. So China disputes that and claims most of the state of uh, Arunachal Pradesh to be their own territory. On the middle sector, it, this is uh, there are few small areas in Uttarakhand and uh, Himachal Pradesh that China claims. Uh, this is not a very uh, contentious uh, dispute and uh, practically it is resolved. And then uh, on the western sector, there is Aksai Chin, uh, which is part of the Indian Union territory of Ladakh. So China occupies Aksai Chin and claims it to be its own territory. The, the line dividing the two armies there, Indian Army and the People's Liberation Army, is known as line of actual control. So, Cho and Lai in 1960 offered a solution. He said that China and India can swap the territory. So, India can keep the McMahon line while Aksai Chin should go to China. So, this basically came to the McDonnell McCartney line, uh, which was one of the lines during the British period. But uh, 
Nehru was uh, adamant on the Johnson line, which is the maximum claim that India India demands. That is, uh, uh, Aksai Chin should be part of India according to the Johnson line. So, since Nehru refused to accept that offer, uh, Chinese decided to you know, use force to take over uh, their claims. In fact, they started advancing even further than their claims. The first thing uh, that that whole area both in, in the eastern and western sector is not really populated. There is hardly any population in these areas and, and especially in the western sector. In the eastern sector still Arunachal of course is populated. But in the McMahon line, in the, in the mountains, there is no population. So the first uh, task of uh, set by each of these governments, Indian government and the Chinese government, was to reach their own claim line. So, so Chinese began to advance and establish posts. And so when India realized that China had done so, and uh, China has also uh, had also built a road in 1957 connecting Tibet with Xinjiang, going through Aksai Chin. So when India learnt of it, uh, Nehru also ordered the Indian army to uh, free Indian territory. So this is known as the forward policy. And uh, on the other hand, the Chinese were settling their boundaries with the other neighbors. For example, in uh, 1960, the Sino-Burmese border agreement was signed. So uh, this was more or less on the line of the McMahon boundary. So because Burma also used to be a province of British India, so it was uh, to the McMahon line also delineated the boundary between Burma and China. They also signed a boundary agreement with Nepal in 1961 and uh, in fact in 1960 a boundary agreement was signed and this was demarcated in 1961 after which another agreement was signed. So peacefully they settled their boundary with both uh, Nepal as well as Burma. On, on basically their uh, western boundary now only two uh, main uh, countries remain that is India and Pakistan. Now India was uh, very confident at that time because they had recently liberated Goa from the Portuguese. And so uh, the Indian army led by as I mentioned before uh, Bridge Mohan call, Lieutenant General Bridge Mohan call, they uh, on, the, on the eastern side they were advancing and, and, and according to some analysis India even crossed the McMahon line uh, in order to uh, take over certain posts and Chinese did not take that lightly and there were skirmishes and uh, by the Chinese and some conflict began and Mao was also trying to assert his power internally and so he, he thought this is this was a good opportunity for him to take command because he was a military leader and uh, by asserting uh, his leadership of the military he could reassert his authority over the government. And this was also interestingly a, a, a time of Cuban Missile Crisis. So Cuban Missile Crisis began on the 16th of October. I want to discuss uh, details of the, uh, this, this particular crisis. This, this was a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. And Mao was aware of the developments. And this was, uh, Mao thought that this was the right time to take action. So when the Cuban Missile war Crisis was going on and both the Soviet Union and the United States were busy and there was no chance of them interfering in the, in the conflict because uh, of the crisis, the People's Liberation Army invaded India. So this uh, full scale invasion was lost, uh, launched on the 20th, 20th of October when uh, PLA crossed the McMahon line as well as advance in Aksai Chin. And Indian army was not prepared. The entire decade uh, was spent by Nehru uh, following a non-violent, diplomatic, you know, peaceful policy, peaceful policy towards the world. He did not believe in militarizing India. He believed that if India does not militarize, then no country would have any problem with India. And therefore, Indian uh, army was ill-equipped. They did not have proper clothes or shoes or weapons to fight with the PLA. And the, the demands made by Nehru and the military leaders, uh, so the chief of staff at that time was General Pranath Thapar. Uh, the, the core commander in the eastern sector was Bij Mohan Kaul, Lieutenant General Bij Mohan Kaul. And so they were forcing the Indian soldiers to go and capture the Chinese positions. 
throw out the Chinese from Indian territory. But the Indian army was not equipped and therefore India was soon defeated and uh, on 28th, 24th of October, Tawang, which is an important town in Arunachal Pradesh, fell to the Chinese. And at that time, Chou Enlai proposed a, uh, gave a proposal for ceasefire. He said that both the armies could withdraw about 20 kilometers and then um, through peaceful negotiations solve the uh, problem. But Nehru was not willing because Nehru said that after advancing 40 kilometers and in fact uh, even more in the eastern sector, Chinese were now saying withdraw 20 kilometers. So basically Chinese were justifying their own aggression and so Nehru did not accept this proposal or realistically that may have been better for India. Instead Nehru appealed for international support but the superpowers were busy with their own Cuban missile crisis and so they were in no position to help uh, Nehru and so there was a correspondence between Nehru and Chou Enlai. Uh, so during that period there was a lull. So war stopped, Chinese stopped attacking except for, uh, so there was no major attacks uh, from around 24th of October. Uh, but eventually Nehru refused to accept the proposal of Chou Enlai and Chou Enlai also refused to amend his proposals. And so on 14th of November, which was interestingly the birthday of uh, uh, Pandit Nehru, the PLA restarted the attacks and uh, Indian army still was not able to defend itself. And by uh, 19th of November, Bomdila fell and, uh, and Assam uh, came, so the PLA reached Assam and they could have uh, invaded the Brahmaputra valley and the Indian army withdrew from Tezpur which was a very important military, uh, military base of the Indian uh, armed forces. And so Nehru had no other option. By this time uh, the Cuban mi missile crisis had ended and he wrote a letter to uh, President John F. Kennedy of the United States. The Soviet Union also uh, gradually started taking a position in the support of India because they had problems with the, with China. So I would like to show you the letter uh, which is very important. So th this shows the mistakes made by the Indian government in the, in the dec decade of the 1950s, how it was ill prepared and uh, how its policy of befriending China and uh, criticizing the West was had ne negative consequences on Indian national interest. So Nehru took a kind of a moral high ground saying the West represented colonialism and American hegemony was not acceptable and so on. But when crisis came, he had to turn towards the United States to seek support. And so what, what did Nehru write? So you can, uh, you can read from here. Within a few hours of dispatching my earlier message of today, so he had written a previous letter that day, the situation in NEFA, that is Northeast Frontier Agency, command has deteriorated still further. Bomdila has fallen and the retreating forces from Sela have been trapped between Sala Ridge and Bomdila. A serious threat has developed to our Digboy oil fields in Assam. With the advance of the Chinese in massive strength, the entire Brahmaputra Valley is seriously threatened and unless something is done immediately to stem the tide, the whole of Assam, Tripura, Manipur and Nagaland would also pass into Chinese hands. So basically we see here that Pandit Nehru had given up on the entire northeast of India. So if uh, Chinese continued to advance then the entire northeast would have been lost and Indian army would have been helpless in this situation. So he continues, the Chinese have poised massive forces in the Chumbi valley between Sikkim and Bhutan. So, uh, so in the in the boundary between Sikkim and China or, or Tibet, so there is a kind of a triangle. So here is Sikkim, here is Bhutan and in between there is a triangle which is basically Chinese territory. So that is known as the Chumbi Valley. So China has basically posted forces in the Chumbi Valley. I will show you in the map later on. And another invasion from that direction appears imminent. So Nehru feared that China will open another front in the war. So there was the western front and the eastern front 
and a third front could be opened in Sikkim and Bhutan. Our areas further northwest on the border with Tibet in the states of UP, Punjab and Himachal Pradesh are also threatened. In Ladakh, as I have said in my earlier communication, Chushul is under heavy attack and shelling of the airfield at Chushul has already commenced. We have also noticed increasing air activity by the Chinese Air Force in Tibet. Now, this is very interesting. India did not use its Air Force, although the Indian Air Force was supposedly superior to the, to the Chinese Air Force uh, because China, India had uh, aircraft from the Second World War and also uh, there was some indigenous uh, production at that time. And uh, so, Indian Air Force was considered to be superior to the Chinese Air Force. And in fact, India has an advantageous position because uh, Chinese had to take off from a height in Tibet and, and therefore uh, their uh, air force would not have been as effective as the Indian Air Force. Uh, this is a criticism, another criticism made against Pandit Nehru that he, he did not deploy the air force. In the letter, he mentions why he has not done so. Okay. Hitherto, we have restricted our request for assistance to essential equipment more comprehensive assistance, particularly air assistance because of the wider, wider implications of such assistance in global context and we did not want to embarrass our friend. Now, he said so far he had not asked for any uh, in substantial assistance in terms of equipment because he did not want to embarrass the friend. So, because of the Cuban missile crisis obviously, uh, both the superpowers were not in a real position to provide substantial help. But now the situation is desperate. We have repeatedly felt the need of using air arm in support of our land forces, but have been unable to do so as in the present state of our air and radar uh, equipment, we have no defense against retaliatory action by the Chinese. So, he feared a response by the Chinese Air Force and many of the experts say that this was unjustified because the Indian Air Force was, was superior to the Chinese Air Force. And therefore, there was no need for India to hesitate in using the Air Force. But according to the perception of Pandit Nehru, he feared the Chinese retaliation. So, therefore, he demanded that United States should send a minimum of 12 squadrons of, this, of supersonic all-weather fighters. And since the Indian Air Force personnel are not trained in flying these, so, United States personnel had to be sent and he guaranteed that uh, the personnel will on, only be used to protect our cities and installations from Chinese air attacks. Okay, so, they will be only used in, uh, in, uh, to protect Indian territory and in action to be taken against the Chinese beyond the limits that is in Tibet. So, this is the aggressive uh, uh, part. So, once uh, the Air Force had defended Indian cities and installations against the Chinese Air Force, then, uh, then they would launch an aggressive attack in, inside Tibet. And, and for that, by that time, basically the Indian Air Force personnel would be trained and so Indian personnel will be used and American personnel will not be used to attack Chinese territory. So, determined as we are to liberate all parts of our territory which may pass into the hands of Chinese aggressors, it is clear that sooner or later we would have to neutralize their bases and airfields by stri striking from the air. So, this was basically a plan to attack the supply supply line of the Chinese because uh, they had a very long supply line. They had to pass through this difficult territory of Tibet to, to supply their troops and so India could take advantage of this by attacking the rear of the Chinese armed forces. He also for that uh, uh, demanded two squadrons of B-47 type bombers and, uh, and the Indian pilots would be sent to US for training to, to, to fly these uh, bombers. And he also guaranteed this will not be used against Pakistan. So, he, he guarantees whatever supplies America provides won't be used in the conflict against Pakistan. So, this is a very interesting letter. We should all uh, read it. This some portions I have read. Uh, so, so, this shows or exposes the, the unpreparedness of the Indian government in the face of uh, war. And then another interesting thing was the All India Radio broadcast of Pandit Nehru on 20th of November. So, by that time, 20th of November, 
Nehru had basically lost heart. He had basically given up. So without uh, American help, he, he, he was, he felt that India would never be able to stop the Chinese. So he says, huge Chinese armies have been marching in the northern part of Nefa. We have had reverses at Walong, Sila and today Bomdila, a small town in Nefa has also fallen. We shall not rest till the invader goes out of India or is pushed out. I want to make that clear to all of you and especially our countrymen in Assam to whom our heart goes out at this moment. So uh, this, this phrase has been quoted in Assam and again and again uh, when uh, Assam was in the height of the Assam movement, anti-foreigners movement as well as the Alf, uh, Ulfa movement. Uh, this was often quoted that India, India treats uh, Assam as a stepdaughter. And uh, so Nehru said that our, my heart goes to the people of Assam. So this is criticized in, in Assam. But then uh, good news was the Chinese declared unilateral ceasefire on the 21st of November. Now this is very interesting. Why did they do so? So basically Americans were willing to help India and uh, American supplies would have been provided and American Air Force could have entered the war. Also, the Soviet Union was now supporting India and uh, Soviet had ad were advising the Chinese to withdraw. So they were putting pressure on the Chinese that they should withdraw. So uh, and plus the supply lines were also extending as uh, Chinese army was entering deeper into India, its supply lines were increasing. And as soon as Indian Air Force with the help of the American Air Force would have entered this, this conflict, then uh, the supply lines could have been attacked. So, and plus the goals of Mao Tse Tung was achieved. He had returned within the power structure as, as this great military lead, leader inside China. Plus he had taught Nehru a lesson. He had cut down um, to size uh, Nehru's international status. And so the Chinese began to withdraw in the in the eastern uh, sector. So basically they went beyond the McMahon line. They left uh, the, the area up to the McMahon line to the Indians. On the western sector, they retained their control over Aksai chain. They withdrew about 20 kilometers to create a buffer area, but they did not give up their, their uh, uh, whatever territory they had occupied in the western sector. The non-aligned movement of which Jawaharlal Nehru was a leader, uh, it tried to uh, mediate in, in, this, in this issue and in Colombo there was a meeting among some of, some of the uh, non-aligned countries led by Sri Lanka, Egypt and uh, Indonesia, Ghana and so on and they gave certain proposals. Now both India and China were not happy with the proposals. India was not happy because uh, the proposals did not declare China as an aggressor upon India. On the other hand, they, they asked the Chinese to withdraw uh, while uh, not asking the Indians to do so. And so the Chinese basically rejected the Colombo proposals. And so this is how the 1962 war ended in humiliation for India and the first Prime Minister of India, Jawaharlal. Nehru and basically he died a weaker leader. Okay, so before the 1962 war, he was a tall leader, very popular in the country, internationally also very, very popular, well respected. But by 64, he had lost his international reputation and also his domestic popularity. So soon he, he died, his health deteriorated and he died. I had also said that Pakistan also had territorial issues with, with China. If you look at this map, uh, Pakistan occupied parts of the state of Jammu and Kashmir. You can see this is the this was the ceasefire line. So this this part, Gilgit Baltistan and Pakistan occupied Jammu and Kashmir was under Pakistan. So that meant that Pakistan and China also shared the frontiers. Okay, so although this is Indian territory, and if if India was control of his entire territory, then Pakistan and China won't have any common boundary because Afghanistan, the Wakhan corridor separates the two. Uh, but, uh, 
but since pakistan had occupied some parts of uh, jammu and kashmir uh, therefore they also shared a boundary and uh, this boundary was soon settled pakistan realized that uh, china is a dangerous power and so uh, in fact uh, the negotiation started just before chinese invasion of india and in 1963 an agreement was signed in which pakistan ceded this area this area here which is known as the sakshkam valley to china and the boundary was settled china also tested its first atom bomb so china became a nuclear weapon power in 1964 so china basically was at a position of advantage in the conflict with india they had defeated india humiliated india in 1962 they signed boundary agreements with other neighbors with burma with nepal and with uh, pakistan they had become a nuclear weapon power so china was an, at an advantageous position and at that time pakistan also thought that they could also take advantage of of the situation and in 1965 they invaded india so uh, basically this was the operation uh, gibraltar so the plan was through the pakistan occupied kashmir pakistan would capture jammu and then thus cut off the kashmir valley from the rest of india and take over the entire state of jammu and kashmir but the indian response was strong pandit nehru had died and so lal bahadur shastri was the prime minister and he ordered the indian army to cross the international boundary towards lahore and the indian army actually reached the city of lahore which was which is the i think the, the largest city perhaps after karachi the second largest city in pakistan and uh, uh, so th this basically neutralized the plans of pakistan so if pakistan occupied uh, jammu and kashmir then they would lose lahore uh, which was unacceptable to them and so there was negotiations and the war basically came to an end and they returned to their starting positions so at the end of the 1962 war basically we see that the macmahon line was restored so the chinese went beyond the macmahon line uh, but in the western sector china occupied occupied aksai chin in fact they this is the uh, area up to which chinese came in 62 they withdrew a little 20 about 20 kilometers which is not much but this is well beyond the mccartney mcdonnell line the green line is the mccartney mcdonnell line you can see here and also the blue line the blue line is the position before the war okay so the chinese gain a lot of territory in the 1962 war okay let's see what happened after that so mao came back to a position of power and he launched the great proletarian cultural revolution to remove all his rivals from positions of power so that he could even internally even in the economic field return to the helm of power and his policies would be actually implemented in china he was been sidelined in especially in economic policy he had been sidelined because of the failure of the great leap forward so mao returned with a bang with the in the cultural revolution china also started training insurgents from the northeast like the naga and mizo rebels so they started receiving training in china in 1967 at the same time maoist insurgency started in naxalbari in west bengal so that is known as the naxalite movement charu majumdar and kanu sanyal they were all influenced by maoism mao zedong thought and so th that is why this is known as a maoist insurgency and because it started from naxalbari it is also known as the naxalite movement so so china was now interfering in the internal affairs of india trying to destabilize india so china had in fact destabilized itself mao had destabilized china through the cultural revolution and he was also trying to destabilize india he was a revolutionary he wanted a revolution he wanted a, a socialist movement everywhere he wanted to overthrow the bourgeois governments everywhere and so so he decided to destabilize india also and at that time uh, china decided to make some advances in sikkim so in nathula and chola two areas uh, i'll show you in the map if you look at the map here so 
So here is uh, Chola and Nathula, this, this area. So the Chinese uh, made some advan advances in this area, but in India responded very strongly. And in this round, India came out basically successful. John Garver, he says, India was quite pleased with the combat performance of its forces in Nathula clashes, seeing it as a signaling dramatic improvement since 1962 war. So since the debacle of 1962, India had focused on equipping its, its military, uh, buying weapons. So the Soviet Union was now supplying weapons to India. So Indian uh, armed forces were being equipped. So by 67, in fact, India fought the 65 war and was able to stop the Pakistanis. They, they, they countered the Pakistani plan of capturing Jammu and Kashmir successfully. And so 67, they were also able to stop the People's Liberation Army in Sikkim. And so India had improved, Indian military had improved in, in five years. On the other hand, China was in trouble because of the Sino-Soviet uh, split. And so in 69, there was a conflict between the, the, the Chinese and the Soviets along in an island of Usuri River. This, this is Usuri River is the boundary between Soviets and the Chinese. So this, this area. So this was all Soviet Union at that time. So the Usuri River is here. And uh, so there was a conflict this area. There was a conflict between the Chinese and the Soviets, almost a war. Uh, in which Chinese suffered, Chinese suffered heavy losses and the Chinese did not want to escalate because the Soviet uh, was a superior power to the Chinese. And uh, India also uh, achieved a victory against Pakistan in 1971 in the 14-day in the war of liberation of Bangladesh. So India was able to liberate Bangladesh on 16th of December. 1971, the Eastern Command of the Pakistan Army surrendered. They signed an instrument of surrender and about 93,000 Pakistani soldiers and officers became prisoners of war with the Indian Army. So that was a great victory for India. Now China also had certain breakthroughs. One of them was the secret visit of Henry Kissinger to China facilitated by, facilitated by the Pakistanis. And so this started a rapprochement with the United States. So because Soviet Union and, and, and China had become enemies, so Americans saw an opportunity here because their main conflict was with the Soviet Union. The Cold War was between Soviet Union and United States. So if they could bring China to their side or at least neutralize them, then that would be an advantage against the Soviets. And so uh, President Nixon had this policy and he sent Henry Kissinger on a secret visit to China. On the other hand, India and Soviet Union came closer. They signed a treaty of friendship. Um, and uh, this was very beneficial for India in the 71 war. In the United Nations, Bhutan, which used to be a protectorate of India, in 1971, it became a member of the United Nations. Soon after, China received, People's Republic of China, received the permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council, replacing the Republic of China or Taiwan. So they replaced them with the support of India. India supported it. Even after the 62 war, India continued to support China, which is considered to be a big mistake. In fact, Sardar Patel mentions this in his letter of 1950 that India should reconsider its support for the UN membership of the People's Republic of China. So anyhow, these are some of the developments. In Nepal also, there was a communist revolt in, in 1971. So this game of uh, cat and mouse continued between India and uh, China. India also became a nuclear power in 1974. Although India refused to uh, develop nuclear weapons, but India displayed a capability of, of building a bomb and testing it. So they tested this in Pokhran. And Sikkim, another protectorate of India, less like Bhutan, Sikkim was also a protectorate of the Indian Union. Uh, Bhutan became uh, independent and it became a UN member. On the other hand, Sikkim was merged with India. And in that referendum, majority of the population of Sikkim voted to join India. So Sikkim became an Indian state. 
This was in 1974-75. And uh, in 76, both Cho and Lai and Mao Zedong died. So, an era came to an end. In the new era, China shifted from Mao to market and this was led by Tang Xiaoping, the paramount leader of China from 1978. In India also there was change. Indira Gandhi, she uh, daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, she was prime minister since 1966. Now this whole uh, realist turn had begun. Uh, so, from a kind of an idealist policy or say a moral realist policy of Jawaharlal Nehru, India turned towards hardcore realism. Uh, started with Lal Bahadur Shastri in the 1965 war, but Indira Gandhi took it further. She was uh, very hawkishly realist. She, uh, you know, used uh, the military. She uh, she formed the research and analysis wing as the external intelligence agency. I had in the debacle of the 1962 war, I had mentioned the failure of the intelligence bureau led by Bholanath Malik. So, a new inter, uh, external intelligence agency uh, research and analysis wing had been created and all these successes in 67 or in Sikkim, these are all uh, under Indira Gandhi, the nuclear test. Okay, she was not hesitant like uh, Nehru uh, in, in asserting India's power in the neighborhood also and also internationally. But the relation with China could not improve in such a condition. And uh, after imposing emergency in 1975, Indira Gandhi lost power in 1977. And the Janata Party came to power under Moraji Desai. And Moraji Desai decided to undo some of the policies of Indira Gandhi uh, and uh, try to develop friendly relations with uh, Pakistan, with China, with United States, you know, with whom uh, India's uh, relations had deteriorated in the time of uh, Mrs. Gandhi. So, with China, you know, they tried to improve relations by sending some uh, uh, politicians to negotiate. Like uh, Dr. Subramaniam Swami played a very important role. He, he kept on going to China every year beginning with nine, um, in 1970, I think 77 or 79, that period he started going to uh, China and laid uh, the ground for better relations with, with China. So eventually in 1979, the foreign minister of uh, India, Sri Atal Vihari Vajpayee at that time, he went to China. And tried to uh, have have a dialogue with with the Chinese leaders, especially uh, Huang Hua. Huang Hua was the foreign minister of China. But China at that time had different plans. They, uh, uh, when Vajpayee was there in China, China invaded Vietnam. Vietnam was a very close friend of India uh, because it was a Soviet ally. And its relation with China had deteriorated. Although China had helped Vietnam during the, its war with the United States, uh, Vietnam uh, China relations had deteriorated. And, and uh, so, uh, and, and because Vietnam had become very assertive in Indo China, uh, it had um, invaded Cambodia, which was ruled by the Khmer Rouge. And, and, and Vietnamese, they, they overthrew the Khmer Rouge and established an alternate uh, communist government. Also in Laos, the Vietnamese uh, had had their um, uh, their influence. Also, the Vietnamese were expelling foreigners, or, or say the the my ethnic minorities within within Vietnam, and also, also uh, people of Chinese origin. And so, all these factors led to deterioration of relation between Vietnam and China. And China decided to teach uh, Vietnam a lesson, basically. And this was also an opportunity for Tang Xiaoping to assert his power, just like Mao used the military in 1962 to assert his power. Uh, Tang Xiaoping also wanted to assert his power because he was not the uh, he was not the chairman of the party at that time. In fact, he, he never held that post. The chairman was Hua Kuofang, the the appointed successor of Mao. Mao himself had nominated him as the successor. 
So to assert his, his authority as the paramount leader, just like Mao had done in 1962, Tang Xiaoping decided to invade Vietnam and at, and at a time when Atal Bihari Vajpayee was on, on Chinese soil and, and so Vajpayee had to soon stop the tour and as soon as he learned of the invasion and he returned to, to India. And so the relation did not actually improve and India, India uh, uh, criticized China and the Chinese invasion of Vietnam. Uh, then in 1980, Indira Gandhi returned to power and she continued with the uh, old channel. So, Subramaniam Swami continued to go to and fro and eventually that uh, led to the foreign minister of China, Huang Hua, visiting India in 1981. And this started a period of dialogue between India and China. But the situation was still not stable and in 1986-87 China tried to push its uh, control of territory in the eastern sector in Arunachal Pradesh that was the union territory at that time in this area. This is known as Sum, this area here, okay. Sum Dorong Chu. Again just like 1967 India responded very strongly. This was under Rajiv Gandhi. Rajiv Gandhi was the son of Mrs. Gandhi. Mrs. Gandhi had been assassinated in 1984 and so although she started a dialogue process with the Chinese, this was continued by Rajiv Gandhi after 84. But uh, India responded strongly to the Chinese in 87 uh, through the Operation Checkerboard. At that time General Sundarji was the chief of army staff and he basically airlifted large uh, Indian uh, troops, this is the operation called the Operation Checkerboard in uh, Sum Dorong Chu and the Chinese had to withdraw from that area. So Indian army had not reached the McMahon line till that time and so under Rajiv Gandhi then India finally Indian army started approaching the McMahon line and also Arunachal Pradesh was granted statehood, it was made a state of the Indian Union. So the interesting thing about the Chinese is Chinese respect strength and so although there were some clashes between India in 67 and um, 86, 87, Chinese respected that and so the dialogue continued. So in 1988 Rajiv Gandhi visited China and a joint working group was formed with a mandate for fair, reasonable and mutually acceptable solution on the boundary question. And this working group met uh, seven times, so there were seven rounds of talk in order to resolve the boundary dispute till 1993 when an agreement was reached and this agreement is known as agreement on the maintenance of peace, tranquility along the line of actual control in the India-China border areas. Okay, so we are going to discuss the the developments in the 90s in the next lecture. So right now let me uh, summarize the situation so far. So India and China fight a war in 62 and India was not prepared and Chinese emerged victorious. India was in fact humiliated. After that India turned towards more hawkish realism. India started developing its own capabilities. And India emerged a regional power because of the, this new militarization with the help of the Soviet Union and also adopting a more hawkish policies in the neighborhood, interfering in, in neighboring countries like dividing Pakistan into two. And this was all done under the leadership of Indira Gandhi. And uh, China also had transformed after the death of Mao Zedong, adopting market economy and Chinese economy began to take off. Now we must understand in the 1980s, Indian economy and the Chinese economy were equal in size. In fact, in terms of per capita income, because Indian population was less than the Chinese population, India was ahead of the Chinese. So India was more economically developed than the Chinese in 1980s. Although India was a poor country, Chinese were even poorer than India. And in international politics, it's about relative power. So relatively, India was stronger than the Chinese in that sense, if you take into account the per capita income. And India had very strong stable governments under Indira Gandhi and 
Rajiv Gandhi. So in 67 and 86, 87, when Chinese tried to advance into Indian territory, India gave a very strong response. Okay, 67, of course, it was not Indian territory, it was Sikkimist territory. Sikkim was at that time not a part of India, but a protectorate. But India was able to protect uh, Sikkim, unlike Tibet in 1950 when uh, Nehru failed to protect Tibet against Chinese aggression because India at that time was dovish in its policy. So there is a hawkish policy and there is a dovish policy. Dovish policy is soft, soft power policy basically, try, relying more on soft power, international influence and diplomacy. Hawkish policy is about using military force, destabilizing other countries and so on. So Indian policy had transformed and because of that, Chinese respected India more in the 1970s and 80s and, uh, and that led to a dialogue process and so in the 1990s there was a more progress in the relation between India and China with the finally with the signing of the 1993 agreement. Uh, you know the dialogue process was stabilized and in the next lecture we will see what further developments were made by the two countries in the 1990s and after that. Thank you. Hello, welcome to a 20 hour course on Introduction to Chinese Studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor of Political Science and International Relations. I am right now working in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences in Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Before that, I worked as Assistant Professor of Political Science at Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have done my Chinese studies from the Center for East Asian Studies in uh, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I have used my experience of uh, studying about China, visiting China, interacting with uh, Indian experts on China as well as uh, Chinese scholars to develop this particular course which has total 20 lectures. Uh, the, uh, let me go through some of them, briefly discuss them. Uh, the first is Origins of Chinese Civilization, which basically discusses how the Chinese civilization started, what were the ideas and, and the situations that lead, led to the emergence of China as a civilization. Second lecture deals with Mandate of Heaven. Uh, Mandate of Heaven is a concept that the Chinese developed about uh, 3000 years ago which says that uh, the rule of a particular dynasty is not per permanent. Uh, the right to rule depends on the virtue of the ruler. So long as ruler is uh, ruling according to the desire of heaven, which is the cosmic law, uh, it can remain in power. But once it deviates from that, it will lose power and a new dynasty will replace it. So that is the concept of Mandela of heaven and that has been a justification used by different dynasties that have come to power in China. Number three is Confucianism. Confucianism has been the official ideology of the Chinese state uh, for um, uh, more than 2000 years. It was only uh, replaced in, in uh, 1911 after the revolution by the Republic of China. So till then Confucian, Conf Confucianism had remained the official ideology of the Chinese state. So it is very important to understand Confucianism in order to understand China. Then the fourth lecture is on schools of ancient Chinese thought. So besides Confucianism, there are other schools also. So this particular lecture goes into that legalism, Taoism and so on and so forth. Number five is on religion in China. So it discusses uh, the religious ideas as, as it emerged in China and then the impact of Buddhism and the different forms of Buddhism in China and also uh, the, uh, the impact of Islam and Christianity on China. The sixth lecture has two parts. One is uh, religious administration in China. 
So religion is regulated in China by the state and, and the party. And so uh, this particular uh, aspect uh, deals with uh, the religious administration in China. And the second part is scientific thought in China. So how scientific thought has emerged in China since the ancient times and why China was not able to uh, remain at the top, why the West overtook China. So these are some of the questions that we examine in, in this particular part. And uh, we also discuss the contemporary situation. What is the contemporary thinking of, of the Chinese government towards uh, scientific knowledge? The seventh and eighth lectures uh, deal, deal with century of humiliation. This is a discourse of, uh, of, uh, on imperialism in China. So the Chinese people believe that China has been exploited by uh, Western powers and especially from the middle of the 19th century up to the middle of the 20th century. So, so what happened during this period? That is the subject matter of these two lectures. Then we have Mao Zedong thought. Mao, um, uh, the founder of uh, the People's Republic of China. So his thought is very important to understand how the Chinese Communist Party state came into existence and what were the ideas that inspired it in the beginning and then how it got transformed. The next lecture, Transition of China to Market Socialism, deals with the transformation of China after the death of Mao in 1976 and up to say 1989, how China transformed itself into a market economy. The next two lectures, 11th and 12th, they deal with the Chinese political system. So China is ruled by the Communist Party and so what is the system that it follows? It is different from the uh, constitutional system in democratic countries like United States or India. Uh, then uh, the next four lectures deal with India-China relations. So the first one begins in the ancient times, say 300 BC and continues till 1949. Uh, so it, 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 it contains the boundary dispute between India and China also. Then the next one, 1949 to 62 deals with the period of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai and uh, the 1962 war. Then we move on to the period from 62 to 93 when there were some conflicts but there were also some attempts to making peace between the two countries. And then the last one is about the rise of China and rise of India and how the competition between the two countries is playing out in the international system. So this is basically deals with the period from 1993 to 2021. And the 17th lecture then is about China in the Cold War, so Chinese foreign policy from 1949 to 1989. And then the, the second part is uh, basically the rise of China from 1989 to 2023, whether the rise of China is a threat to the world, whether it is an opportunity for the world or it is a myth, actually China, China's rise is something which is not going to continue. So these are some of the issues that we discuss in this particular lecture. And then we have a trans Himalayan strategy. A string of pearl strategy and belt and road initiative these are some of the geo strategies of china how china is trying to uh, use strategy to dominate the geopolitics of what is what what is known as indo pacific and the and finally the last lecture deals with soft power in china's foreign policy discourse this is my uh, original research I, this is my area of expertise and uh, i have i have uh, included some of my findings in this uh, particular lecture. So this is how uh, the 20 hour lecture series goes. I hope you um, listen to these lectures and develop a good understanding of China because China is a very important neighbor, large and powerful neighbor of India. So every Indian should know something about China. So I hope this lec these lectures are useful for that purpose. Thank you.